So uh, welcome to tonight's workshop. My name is Dr. Nick Araza of Santa Barbara Family Chiropractic and uh, Good Better Best Nutrition Practices. So uh, if you're here with us in the clinic, thank you. I appreciate it. If you're here at home, thank you for coming and tuning in. I really appreciate your guys' energy and time on this most important topic of nutrition. And I've kind of geared this to range from novice. Maybe you've never even looked at the back of a nutrition label. What's a nutrition label? Uh, all the way to maybe you've studied this stuff quite a bit and in the, in, everywhere in between. Okay, so I do these types of workshops. I'm a chiropractor, you guys didn't know that. Uh, what, what business do I have talking about nutrition? Well, what I've figured out and what I've found over the course of my, uh, my time as a healthcare provider is that people who eat health, healthfully, they heal faster. They have less injuries and they have a better quality of life over a long range time period. Did that just blow your mind or is that pretty common sense? Right. So uh, <clears throat> the, the goal of tonight's workshop is to challenge you guys, to challenge you guys to take action uh, around your health, uh, specifically this nutrition piece of that puzzle. And uh, to, to get it also, if, if you've already had some energy towards that, to get a renewed determination. Okay, so um, essentially challenging us because our culture is very reactionary oriented. And so we want to get out of that reactionary into the uh, proactive model down a different path that should be a pivot point in your nutritional uh, lifespan where you've said, oh yeah, that made a big difference and now I've started down a different path or at least I'm getting more energy towards that, okay? So uh, a, a personal story on this topic, just to get us started and how this affects uh, how, I, how I look at nutrition. I haven't told this in a long time uh, at a workshop, but when I was in my early 20s, so about 15 years ago, uh, my grandmother, uh, Grandma Ebba, she, uh, she was late 70s, she uh, started to have show signs of dementia and then full-blown Alzheimer's. So if, if you guys have ever known someone who's had that, um, you know that you, you start to lose them before you lose them and it's a pretty tough, tough situation. And I remember this one time that I was up there visiting with my grandfather because she was no longer, she needed 24-hour supervision or care. So um, she essentially, uh, my grandfather and I, and I went up to visit her. And we were walking through the facilities, which was a beautiful facility. We were outside and we went to go and sit down on this park bench. And my grandpa, who was a construction worker for 30, 40 years, I'm sorry, a carpenter, a uh, carpenter for 30, 40 years, he, had, he was tough as nails. I mean, this guy got blown up off a tire. He had spikes go through his hands. He lost an eye. I mean, this guy was tough. And I remember him and I and my grandma, and he sat down on this bench and he invited her, you know, to sit down next to him. And he said, I remember he even said, he said, come sit down next to your old man. You know, he was kind of joking around. And, and she looked at him and she looked at the bench and she just, said no, because she looked at him as a stranger. And, you know, she obviously didn't know me as her, as her grandson if she didn't know her own husband of 50 plus years. That was, that was really painful to see this hardened guy, this guy that was so tough, try to get his wife, he was almost kind of pleading, and it was, it, it was just, it broke my heart when I saw that interaction. What does that have to do with what we're talking about tonight? Well, research is linking the foods that we eat to chronic degenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, dementia, cancers of all kinds, um, or many kinds, and heart disease, diabetes, all of these things, these chronic degenerative diseases are being linked to nutrition. Okay, now we all do the best that we can with the information that we have regarding pretty much all topics. And so my grandma did the best that she could, okay? But she was Danish. She came from Denmark. You guys have heard of a Danish before, right? She had a sweet tooth something fierce. And she ate, you know, a lot of sweets. She was a petite woman, very small, very, but a firecracker. But she, she, I know that she didn't eat as well as she could have if she had known what I know. And that's why I want to do this for you guys and help you guys understand truly the consequences of the food choices that you make every day. Because they can lead you down a better or worse path, okay? And we have to understand that food is bigger than weight. You know, weight is important. And we have a lot of, you know, confidence and it can help. If we lose a few pounds, we definitely feel better more confident, more able, but, but food is much bigger than that. It literally powers, it, it connects your brain, it's how you build your skin, your eyes, your digestive tract, all of that is built through the foods that you choose. Okay, so this is a really important workshop and I'm really glad that you guys made that. So what we wanna stop doing is being mechanistic, 
okay? And mechanistic is trying to take apart food into its nutrients, vitamins, calories, servings, all that. I did that when I was younger, when I was in my teens. I was very mechanistic, trying to figure out how to get ripped, how to get shredded, how to get yoked. You know, that's what, that was my goal back then. I wanted to do that. Um, and, and I kept trying to count calories and, and add and take away and do this and that. And what it, it led me down an inflamed, uh, in terms of systemic inflammation, in a place where I hurt myself. And this all came together in understanding food's role in my life as a holistic healthcare provider, as a holistic person is when I found myself in my chiropractor's office for the first time. This was the first time that I went and I was having terrible low back pain, terrible pain. And I went into this, uh, this, this chiropractor's office. It was um, a female chiropractor, a male chiropractor. They had to practice together. And uh, she helped me get a 30,000 foot view. She, she helped me understand how the body works. Because when I, when I had my first appointment there, and I gave her, her my x-rays to look at, and I had been to lots of different healthcare providers, and she was looking at them. This was, I was probably like two minutes in the door, not very long. She's looking at them, she looks at me, she looks at them, and she's, she's about to say something, and I, I know it's gonna be big, and I'm like, what, what is it? What are you looking at? What do you see? You know? And I had been to ortho, so I was like, you're probably gonna tell me about the retro, retrolisthesis down in my L5, that's probably what you're gonna tell me. And she looks at me and she says, do you have a lot of gas? This was like two minutes into, into that, and I was, like, I was like, okay, lady, I'm here for my back. <laughs> you know? So again, when we talk about that mechanistic, is like, I was like, um, you know, my back is what hurts. You know, <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but really, what does that have to do with my spine? You know, that doesn't bother me that much. It might bother some other people. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know. I, and what, I, what she taught me and what I, what I soon learned is it's all connected. Everything, the foods we eat, our spine, uh, our exercise patterns, it's all connected. She helped me understand that the, 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 the injury to my spine uh, was irritating a nerve that fed into my digestive tract. And so it was irritated and it wasn't digesting foods properly, so there was a lot of air. And in turn, when you have a lot of air in your abdomen, it turns off musculature so you can't tighten it, your core like you should. And so you leave yourself more susceptible to injuring your back. So I was on this vicious cycle where I wasn't eating the right foods, I had sublux subluxation or a problem in my spine which is causing nerve irritation. And it was this cycle that, that was the first time I had this aha like, oh you mean like, it's all, all of it? Like you can't just look at your wrist or your back or your stomach or your digestion or your brain or all of it, it's all connected. And so what I wanna do for you tonight is blur the lines help you to understand that you are in an incredible ecosystem of cells that are working together to achieve harmony all the time. And it's just we have to put energy into all these categories. And nutrition is a big one. You can see that poster there on the right-hand side. Think how you manage your stress. Well, have you ever had an upset stomach from how you think? Have you guys ever had lost your appetite from stress? Totally interconnected there. The, the, the foods you 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 choose are obviously, and that's what we're going to get to in just a few minutes here. Movement patterns, how you exercise or don't exercise, your foundation, your spine, your nervous system, it's all connected. Okay, so if you are eating the best possible foods after we go over tonight and you go home and you just eat this way for the rest of your life and it's perfect, if you're not working on your stress, your spine, your movement patterns, you're still not going to get the most out of that food. Do you understand what I'm saying? So you got to look at it holistically. Okay. I'm going to bring it together here. This is this took me like an hour, this slide, so pay attention, okay? <laughs> Your nutrition has three parts. Ingestion, what you choose to eat. Digestion and absorption, uh, how your body breaks down that food, and then using that food as energy. Okay, now check this out. Your nervous system impacts all of those. You get to decide what you're going to eat through your nervous system, but it also has a, a big role in how your digestion works and how you use that. Exercise affects your nervous system, which affects your digestive and absorption, and your utilization. If you're not exercising on a regular basis, you literally can't use your food as well. It won't go through you as fast, it'll store up, you'll bioaccumulate more toxins. So exercise is a vital component to having proper healthy nutrition, digestion, absorption. Stress affects, well stress affects everything. Okay. Nervous system affects, affects your stress, which affects your exercises, which your stress can affect your nervous system which can affect your stress, which can, your spine affects your nervous system, which affects your, your, your nervous system, or your spine, if I didn't say that, I'm saying lots of things. And then we have at the bottom, attitude, sleep, community, spirituality, what are we describing? 
Look at that fancy graphic right there. Lifestyle. That's right. I learned how to do that. Um, so it's your lifestyle. So all of this stuff is super interconnected, okay? And I'm beating this in because this is important. It all matters, okay? Now we get to talk about what do we eat, okay? This is from John Durant's book, which is awesome. So I read hundreds of these books for, for nutrition. And uh, this one really influenced me uh, recently. So this is cool. Michael. Michael's story. <clears throat> so Michael was a medical curiosity, though his case started out commonly enough. Born in Chicago, he moved to Cleveland when he was young. As Michael drifted into middle age, he became increasingly overweight, yet showed no interest in changing his habits. Okay. But after a close friend died of a heart attack, he was compelled to visit the doctor's office for a checkup. The results from a standard blood test revealed a slew of bad but unsurprising news. High blood pressure, elevated cholesterol, high triglycerides. A cardiac ultrasound showed signs of left ventricular hy hypertrophy, a thickening of the heart muscle, and an indicator for heart disease. The doctor did what most doctors would do for someone with these symptoms. She put Michael on two blood pressure medications, carvedilol, and a beta blocker, and lisinopril, an ACE inhibitor, while looking into ways to change his lifestyle. Yet when the doctor began to probe for the typical culprits, she came up short. Michael did not smoke. He did not drink. He didn't eat any of the fatty foods that are widely blamed for obesity and heart disease. In fact, Michael was a vegan. Red meat wasn't even on the menu. No soda either. A typical meal was a salad, some fruit, a few fiber bars fortified with nutrients, vitamins, and minerals. If most doctors heard an overweight patient with a heart disease claim to eat the way that Michael did, they'd start quoting House MD. Everybody lies. <laughs> okay, other common culprits included a lack of exercise, bad genetics, and bad genetics. Michael wasn't exactly an exercise buff. He never went to the gym. But on the other hand, he walked everywhere he needed to go. Maybe Michael was just unlucky and had bad genes. Why is this in a storybook? Because Michael is actually Mikolo. Okay, he's a western lowland gorilla in the Cleveland Metro Parks Zoo. Did you guys know that the number one killer for gorillas in captivity is heart disease? Similar to the number one killer of humans in captivity, heart disease. <laughs> Erwin LaCour called us, called humanity zoo humans, okay? So on top of this, um, on top of his overweight and heart disease, he also had developed, both of them, this is B-Bac on the left, Macolo on the right, um, he had also developed impulsive control disorders. He was, they were both pulling out their hair to the point of baldness in certain areas, and food regurgitation. Have you guys ever seen that on YouTube? Well. Uh, apparently, a lot of gorillas held in captivity will, will regurgitate their food over and over and over after a meal about five to six times. Okay? And they re-eat it, regurgitate it, re-eat it, regurgitate it, right? It's kind of gross. Really gross, I guess. Not kind of. <laughs> yeah, you don't need to make that word smaller. All right. <clears throat> so, um, gorillas live, on average, they can live to their 40s and 50s. Okay? In the 1850s, Gorillas were only making it in zoos six months. Six months was their life expectancy once they entered a zoo in the mid-1800s. And on their diet per, dietary plan was things like alcohol and candy. Okay? In the 70s, a guy wrote a book. Yeah, this is crazy, right? A guy wrote a book named Don Cousins, and he went around the world and checked out different zoos, and he talked about gorillas' different diets in different places, and he said that, interestingly enough, the Italian gorillas like to have their morning tea with biscuits, and the Texan gorillas like horse meat and jello. Okay, so what I'm saying here is that human beings don't have any business telling a gorilla what to eat. Okay, if we want to find out what a gorilla should eat, what should we do? Look at nature, Look at nature right? Right, exactly. <laughs> so, where's he going to go with this? Okay, let's keep playing this game. Oh, by the way, what they did to fix that, their, their dietary habits, their impulsive control disorder, their weight gain, their heart disease, is that they went to nature. They found out what gorillas should be eating in the wild, and they mimicked that diet. 
They ended up eating twice the amount of calories per, that's what the wild was, twice the amount of calories. And over three months, by eating a natural-based diet, what gorillas are supposed to eat, he lost 70 pounds. His blood markers changed. He stopped vomiting up his food and eating it again. He got better. He got healthier because he found out, we found out what to feed them. Okay. So continue this madness here. This is silly questions, but what should that creature there, which is a heriku, what should that cow eat? There you go. C. Okay. What about this one? Meat. Meat. All right. What about this one? Okay. So this is where, you know, this is why the, the reason that I like Paleolithic um, as, a, as a nutritional recommendation, which we're going to talk a lot about today, is because it offers a reference standard. Just like wild gorillas offer a reference standard for gorillas' diet, wild humans offer a reference standard for us. Okay, and if we eat like wild humans ate, then we should be healthy. Does that make sense? That's why I like paleo, because it makes sense. Okay, so anthropologists and some nutritionists have long recognized that the diets of Paleolithic hunter-gatherer uh, represent a reference standard for modern human nutrition, okay, and a, and a way to protect yourself against Western disease, okay. If you want to be rich, who do you study, rich people or poor people? Rich people, right? If you want to have a good golf swing, you should study someone with a good golf swing. If you want to have a good marriage, don't study that guy. <laughs> study, <laughs> study, I'm sorry, study someone with a good marriage, right? It's just simple. So we're trying to study people that are healthy and eat like them because it's much easier to, mo to model something like that. So hunter-gatherers versus agriculture. Okay, so this is pretty wild, but if you take a human being and feed them foods that you would find in nature that are hunted and gathered, they get healthier. When you feed them uh, foods that are farmed or processed, they get less healthy. This is clear throughout anthropological, anthropological data. This is a really cool and interesting case because they found bones of um, what we call Neolithic new farmers in the same region that they found hunter-gatherer bones, just about 4,500 years difference. So the same, it's the Ohio River Valley in Ohio. Um, <coughs> But they had, so 5,000 years ago, hunter-gatherer bones, 500 years ago, farmer bones. Got it? Okay, this is what they found. Hunter-gatherers were six inches taller. Hunter-gatherers had almost zero cavities, whereas agriculturalists had seven per person. Hunter-gatherers had much lower infant mortality rates. They had less infectious disease and bone malformations. They had no iron, calcium, protein deficiencies, which was common to the agriculturalists. DNA evidence shows that genetically humans have hardly changed at all in the last 40,000 years. We could take us and go back 40,000 years and trade it out, and theoretically we'd have the same. Obviously, they would be more well adapted to that stuff since we, I, I don't know how to hunt very well and all that stuff, but um, essentially the people haven't changed, okay? And just to help you put this in perspective, okay, how long have we been farming versus how long did we hunt and gather? If we were standing on the zero yard line, we could pretend that that's where humanity came on the scene. At the 5, the 10, the 15, the 20, the 25, 30, 45, 50, 55, 60, 65, 70, 75, 80, 85, 90, he could go all the way 95, 99.5 yards of that is where we were hunting and gathering. Only the last half yard in terms of the history of human beings, have we been farming, okay? So even though it seems like it's the norm, it's not. What we're bodies are used to, what we're evolved or created for was a lifestyle completely different than what we are now, okay? <clears throat> in the last five inches of that, I mean, picture yourself standing on a football field and looking, you're on the 99.5 and looking that way. All of that distance, we've been doing it one way, and then we switched in the last 5,000 to 10,000 years. And then the last five inches, about yay big, that's when we started having what we call the norm, you know, like um, internet, TV, hungry man, dinners, that kind of stuff. The things that we know that exist now, being able to drive through a drive through that's the norm, right? That's been going on forever. No, five inches of that time period. Okay, usually about this time, people are thinking, well, what about lifespan? If they're so healthy, how come? Didn't they all die when they were like 14 or 17 or something like that? Okay, let me ask you guys. Do you guys, can you gather? So Paleolithic, just the word itself, means old stone age. It's anything 
from 2 million years to about 10,000 years, all hunting and gathering. Can you guess what the average life expectancy was for, for a hunter-gatherer? <clears throat> Throw out some numbers, people. 40. 35. What else we got? 40. 40. 130. 130. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Anybody else? 16. 16? 16. 16. You guys are running out there. Okay. 33. Okay. Now picture a world where you camped all the time without the luxuries of a tent and you know, modern day stuff. This is, that's Paleolithic, so it was a very different world. It was very hard living. Okay? What about when we entered into the farming era, Neolithic? What do you think our lifespan was then? 65. 65. Anybody else? It's still 35. 35. Low 50s. Low 50s. 20. Oh. Dropped considerably from Paleolithic to when we started farming. We traded you know, we traded a healthier way of life for stability, culture, being able to, you know, have music and all these kinds of things that we know now able to do because of having centralized food production. But we traded a lifespan. There was a lot more infectious diseases and a lot more nutrition deficiencies. And now worldwide, we've increased that back up to 75 or 60, 67 worldwide. I think in the U.S. is about 75. So. What recaptured from 20 to 33 and above has really been two major things. We've recovered it through sanitation, so we don't go to the bathroom where we live, where the Neolithic period, they didn't know that a lot of times, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, refrigeration, so that's number one. Those are the two, bi two big ones. And then trauma care. When you look at the math, which I think I have on this next slide here, the top is Paleolithic, and it says here 33 years uh, was their average life expectancy. But if a hunter-gatherer made it to 15 years old, they could expect about 55-year lifespan. The first 10 years were very dangerous. Okay? Other things would eat us. You know, we, we didn't have it as good. But you can see through here, uh, Rome, classical Rome is 20 to 30 age life expectancy. And it's pretty much 20. The, the medieval times were down in the teens. It's brutal at that point. But what we see differently, though, is hunter-gatherers that live past 60 don't suffer from the neurodegeneration, the, uh, the degenerative chronic diseases that we are, we are known. Okay. Weston A. Price, this is a guy who, dentist, he traveled around the world checking out different populations that were hunter-gatherers. And what he found, this was in the 20s and 30s, is that they had beautiful teeth, no cavities. They had arches that were huge, they could fit all their teeth in, even their wisdom teeth because they chewed stuff that wasn't processed. So their jaws got bigger and stronger and they could fit all of that. He was concerned as to why we were all getting crooked and cavities and all that. And what we found is that it ate completely different from the land. So you are what you eat, and this is a document here that says essentially paleo versus United States intake of vitamins and nutrients, where paleo uh, hunter-gatherers typically take in about six times, three to 10 times, uh, more vitamins and minerals. So what didn't they eat that we eat a lot of? This is a graph of how we eat, and that's a cool graph from uh, Mark Sisson, his primal blueprint. But you can see they ate vegetables, fruits, meat, fish, fowl, eggs, nuts and seeds, herbs, spices, and honey. What we eat is all this white stuff wasn't even around. It wasn't available. So refined, gra refined sugars, vegetable oils, grains, and dairy. Grains to some degree very small, but not substantial, no dairy whatsoever. Imagine trying to wrestle a large auroch. This is a huge cow with horns. You're like, I'm gonna milk you, let's do this. <laughs> it's not worth it, right? You're not gonna go do that. So they didn't, they didn't drink much dairy, all right? <clears throat> so but you can see here, refined, all of those things that were not even available back then com comprises about 71% of the United States average diet, okay? Now, <clears throat> What they ate a lot more of was this. They ate a lot more animals. Okay? In fact, when you do a, a reference study of all contemporary hunter-gatherer societies, more than half of their calories came from animals. Okay? Animals, that's calorically, not volume-wise. Volume-wise was plants. So they ate a lot more plants, but the cal calories were from animals because fat and meat and organs make uh, a lot more calories. Now, which do you think they ate, obviously, right? The ones on the left, okay. So why this slide is here is because it makes a huge impact 
as to what kind of meat you eat. Okay? If you, and you can imagine, are these cows, I don't know if you guys can see this, but there's a lot of cows here. And that back in the distance is probably another 100,000. <clears> so a lot of cows that they cram in there versus a grass-fed farm <clears throat> in Massachusetts that I checked out. You can see which, which looks happier, right? Okay. So happier, healthier animals are healthier, and they make you healthier if you eat them. Sicker, stressed-out animals make you sicker if you eat them. So what's good for you is also good for them. So farming practices. So volume-wise, make, so obviously, I mean, they're very colorful, right? <laughs> but it's you know, Nutella and goldfish and a whole bunch of processed foods. Not hard to chew, right? Versus this, where we have all different colors of different vegetables. So that, that was the volume. A lot of plants and a lot of animals. House made of. So what you eat builds your body. We talked about my grandma. We talked about that. It's true for your house. If you use high quality materials to build your house, you're going to have an awesome product. If you use terrible quality materials to build your house, you're not going to want to live there. It's the same thing for your body. It's not going to last as long. Even if it looks nice, but you use cheap stuff, it's not going to last as long. Do you guys see what I'm saying? Same thing for your foods. Okay? But where's the grains and the dairy? They make up a lot of big portion of my plate or my pyramid. Okay, this question always comes up, so we have to address this. What a grain is. You have to understand that certain plants have, have a, sim, uh, what's a symbiotic, a, a synergistic relationship with human beings. It's like a I'll give you a little if you do this for me. It's kind of like a given win-win, you know, which is good, like an avocado plant, tree. That is a win-win. It's like if you, here, here's the deal, humans. If, uh, if I give you some nutrients and some good stuff and some tastiness, will you take my progeny, my, my kid, and plant that somewhere that I can, can't, can't go because I'm stuck here? Do you guys see what I'm saying, this synergistic relationship there? It's a win-win. It's a <laughs> And it's good. Avocados are delicious, right? Other plants, we eat things that they don't want us to eat. Namely, their kids. Okay, so I want you to think about this because it makes it real simple. A wheat kernel, wheat gr grain right there, uh, oats, barley, sorghum, all that stuff, is the actual genetic potential of that plant. It's their kids. It's their offspring. It's not a win-win. We're going like, to eat your kids. What are you going to do about it? Right? <laughs> Well, they do stuff about it, okay? So <clears throat> it's just that it's not, it's not horns like, a, like when you're trying to eat a cow or whatever. It, do, it doesn't fight back. It, it fights back chemically, okay? So this is like a, a kernel here of wheat. That's the right term there. So you got an outer bran, an endosperm, and a germ. So that's actually what turns into the, the wheat kid, whatever you want to call it here. That's, <laughs> that's the technical term. Uh, all right. <laughs> so... Bran, the whole stuff. We say whole wheat is good, whole, bran, whole, whole grains are good. Bran is where the plant puts a lot of things to protect itself, namely phytates, lectins, and protease inhibitors, which we're going to talk about in a second. But they're working to punch holes in your intestines and break your intestines apart. Even if you don't feel it, they do it. And they're fighting back. They're just doing it chemically. Okay. So they're, they're saying, quit eating me. That's really the, the gist there. Uh, which we're going to come back to when we t talk about the uh, intestines here in just a minute. But a lot of times when I say stop eating gra grains, people say, well, what about fiber? Okay. Well, this shows pretty clearly. On a 1,000 calorie basis, we have refined cereals coming in at 6 grams. We have whole grains cereals coming in at 24 grams of fiber. We have fruits at 41. And if you eat the same amount of calories and vegetables, you get 185 grams of fiber. So vegetables have way more fiber than any whole or unwhole grain. Okay, anti-nutrients in you. So those th three things that I listed just a minute ago that are contained in the bran or the outer portion that does chemical warfare, phytate, lectin, and protease inhibitors. Phytate binds to minerals so that we can't have them. Okay, so that's why our agriculturalist ancestors, when we shifted from hunting and gathering to farming, we got shorter by six inches. I mean, if you look at the, have you ever been, if you've been to Europe, medieval Europe, if you looked at some of the, the castles and stuff, some of the doors are this tall. You ever seen that? It's because they were living off of a few starchy crops that had hardly any minerals. And what they did have, the, a lot of wheat and you know, barley, oats, those types of things, they were bind so they couldn't even access the nutrients. So when we're living heavily off of that stuff, we have poor development. Okay? Osteoporosis, infections, slow healing. All of that comes from phytate. Okay? Lectins 
are big bad things that poke holes in your intestines, like gluten. That's the, that's the biggest, baddest lectin, but all, all grains have it. And they're poking holes in your intestines, and uh, which can create all kinds of inflammation and autoimmune disorders. Things like MS, things like psoriasis, I mean the list goes on. Allergies too. Uh, protease inhibitors, that's uh, something to stop our digestion from breaking apart proteins. So you, again, you don't allow for the use of the proteins, and worse yet, when we have a leaky gut created through the lectins poking holes in our guts, that allows for the autoimmune cascade. So this is a, oh yeah. So this is in uh, Lauren Cordain's book, book when we talk about dairy, which we will in a minute. Um, anybody under the age of three should not have any dairy, period. Okay, which we'll get to why. It just causes a lot of autoimmune problems, uh, especially like diabetes type one, which you're stuck on insulin for the rest of your life. Okay. This is your intestines, okay? I want you to understand grains and how it translates to allergies and autoimmune disorders, okay? So, here, here's a, I, I'm gonna need to draw, is there a, perfect, okay. Just so we can see this in action. Okay, so we've got the cross section of your GI tract, so food's coming in this way, okay? So this isn't exactly how it looks, all right? <laughs> but um, you have this covering here, okay? And you got like lots of white blood cells, lots of things to try to protect, because this is open airway, open ways from the outside world into your digestive tract, okay? So when you eat something, uh, this is where it goes, that, you know, stomach, and it gets down here, it gets broken down, and then it's absorbed through this wall for very, complex uh, mechanisms that happen that we don't need to go into, but one at a time. So if you eat like a piece of meat, it's broken down into amino acids, individual amino acids, and then they're absorbed, okay? Um, <clears throat> now, if you eat or gluten or something wheat-based or grain-based, what happens is you get these lectins, we'll put an L here, they try to punch, they don't try, they do, they punch a hole here, okay? If you eat it on a regular basis, you know, it's going to punch lots of holes if you only eat it every now and then. Your body can usually deal with it. Depends on how often uh, is also the, the insult happening. So when they punch a hole like this, rather than the individual amino acids getting through, we have big proteins that are able to pass through this. And when they get through, your body mounts an attack. Okay? Because it's not supposed to have a big protein. It's just supposed to have amino acids. It's like, hey, what's this thing? Let's get it. So it mounts an attack, and some proteins from dairy, some proteins from chicken, some protein, does, doesn't matter where the protein is, but sometimes proteins look similar to other parts of proteins in our body. So, <clears throat> for example, with diabetes, if the protein gets there that similarly looks like our pancreas, then you have a white blood cell that attacks this and then gets confused and attacks your pancreas. And if that happens enough, you lose your pancreas in terms of the ability to produce insulin. Okay, and then you're diabetic, type 1. Insulin's forever. Do you guys understand that? Does that make sense to some degree? Um, same thing if, if, if it's a protein that mimics, it looks similar to uh, the sheaths on your nerves, then your white blood cells can attack that and you could end up with multiple sclerosis. Not only do that, you get inflammation there as well. So grains mess you up, okay? Even if you don't feel it at the time, they're doing it, okay? Um, if you sprout them, you can get away with it more often because that deactivates a lot of things. Any questions on that so far? Okay, I'm trying to make this as simple as possible. Here we go. We're going into, so allergies, also that's how you get food allergies a lot of times. You have a hole open there, some bit of chicken or a bit of avocado gets through there that hasn't been digested fully because of protease inhibitors, they stop that. It gets in there, your body mounts an attack, and now you're allergic to avocado and chicken or whatever it is because stuff got through that wasn't supposed to get through because grains are busting holes in there. The hole will stay there for a while. If you stop eating grains, it can heal. But if you keep eating them, and really you need to keep eating them every 10 days. If you're eating grains closer together than 10 days, 10 to 14 days, they can't, your stomach, you can't heal. It sucks. It means, it means that you, you know, even if you I only cheat once a week, that's keeping those holes open. Okay. So, <clears throat> moving on. Why do animals drink milk? Why do animals drink milk? Grow. To grow. That's perfect, to go from that little cow to that big cow. 
Okay? So if you have goals around growing, if you have goals around gaining weight, then by all means, keep drinking lots and lots of milk. Uh, real world right here, we got that guy back there. This is 100% breastfed. Bennett, day four. Bennett, day 100. <laughs> Look at that monster. <laughs> that is the, that's my arm, same distance. Look at that, that big. We can't even fit, that's his, his head is almost as big as that. <laughs> He's doubled his weight in like three months, less than that. It was like January, so October to January. All he's on is milk, okay? So milk has lots of sugar in it, which helps us to grow. It also has lots of hormones, which helps us to grow, okay? So cow's milk is designed for cows to help them do that, okay? So if you're on the football team and you wanna, that's the right thing for you maybe, okay? <laughs> but most of us aren't trying to do what Bennett just did. Okay, uh, any questions on that? Okay, not only that, but there's a lot of proteins that with this can cause problems, uh, autoimmune, big time, especially under the age of three, because they're, uh, human beings are born with a leaky gut so that mom's milk can go through and some of the immune protectors, those big proteins need to go through. That's how he fights disease um, when he doesn't have much of an immune system. So Jen gets exposed to the same things, her body makes the immune and it goes right through his leaky gut. That's brilliantly designed, but by six months to a year it starts to close up but it's still open and if you're given cow's milk, then it's open to cow's milk, whatever that cow was making for your baby. Does that make sense? Okay. What, what do the children drink then between the stopping of breastfeeding till the age of three? Well, I would, I would suggest that they stop drinking milk, period. That would be a one, one goal of, of mine. Um, and by milk, you're meaning cow's milk. Cow's milk, yeah. right, cow's milk. And if they're going to drink cow's milk, it would have to be whole, pa non-pasteurized. We don't want to have the stuff that gets heated up super high and killed. The reason they pasteurize milk is because they, you remember the picture of all those cows? They don't treat cows very well, and so they're unhealthy. And so they get sick, and they have all kinds of mastitis and pus and bacteria in the milk. So instead of treating the cows nice and making them healthy, they just nuke the milk kill everything in it, including the nutritional value. Okay. So what do you give the children to drink then? Water. <laughs> <laughs> Coconut water. Kombucha. No. Not kombucha? I don't know. Not at three, maybe not. No, no, no. <laughs> Cancel that. Cancel that one. No kombucha. Uh, but water. Uh, what's that? Tea? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Better than what they used to do. Uh, right, okay. Did you guys know that a dairy cow, an industrial dairy cow, lives to about three? Dairy cow's lifespan, 30, 15 to 30. But an industrial dairy cow, three. They treat those cows real well, right? So, also, how we vote is through purchases. If we buy, you know, milk that comes from cows that are being beat up all the time, then we'll keep having cows that are beat up. If we buy them from healthy grass-fed you can get at the, whole, at the farmer's market, you can get whole uh, raw dairy, which is delicious. You can get that from Lassen's, maybe Lazy Acres. Yes. Okay. All right, <clears throat> so what to eat? Five food groups redefined. This is a great quote from uh, Michael Pollan in defense of food. Eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Okay, so volume-wise. So number one, we want to eat lots and lots of vegetables. Best, local and organic. Uh, meat, we want to eat wild game if possible. That's what our ancestors ate exclusively. That was it, wild game. That's all that was available. Beef, organic, pastured, so that means grass-fed. You wanna look for 100%, not finished. That means that they can just give them a little bit of grass at the end, call it a day. Poultry, eggs, pasture-free range, so healthy chickens. Again, same, pr same principle for all animals. Fruit, nuts, seeds, local, raw, organic, unsalted if, pref if possible. How about farmed fish? Five years ago, no. Now they're doing a better job of farming with good, they're, they're like looking in to see what do fish eat and fish feeding them that. Five years ago when they started or kind of weren't into it, they would just feed them whatever, usually corn and soy. Corn and soy, that's not what fish eat. Did they ever have, what, what, what fish ever ate a co or, or corn? Where, where is that possible, <laughs> right? Uh, or yeah, edamame, right? Um, <clears throat> same thing for cows. They feed industrial cows corn and soy. What does a cow eat? Grass, we did that game, right? I mean, come on, that's just because it, corn and soy helps cows get 
fat real quick. Okay, so that's also why we don't want to eat corn and soy. So what do we eat? Okay. So this is the kind of stuff that when you start doing paleo, there are tons of recipe books, there are tons of different cookbooks out there, and experimentation's fun. You know, we have a slow cooker chicken soup. Jen made that and took that beautiful picture. Uh, we have grass-fed burgers, uh, lettuce, tomato, pickle, avocado, sweet potato fries, and this colorful medley of bacon and Brussels stuffed chicken breasts. Okay, sounds delicious, right? Yeah, it is delicious. We didn't change in um, eating like tasty for not tasty, it's still, it's probably tastier. And you feel better, you don't feel like, oh, after a big plate of pasta, you know. Um, what about breakfast? Let's not forget that. Oh, we got that chicken soup again. That's, that's right, chicken soup for breakfast. Uh, and, but we did it, spruce, we sprued it, no, we spruced it up with a green shake, okay? <laughs> so, we do a lot of smoothies. Uh, smoothies just have vegetables, some sort of healthy fat, um, some mixed berries or fruit to make it palatable. Um, and then, um, that's usually it. We got a recipe we can give to you. What's the healthy fat that you put in there? Usually uh, olive oil or coconut oil oh. or avocados, okay, or raw eggs. Got to be healthy eggs though. All right, performance eating. So a couple quick tips here on performance eating if you're athletic. This, the cool thing about this is that if you're eating for health, it covers it, you know. Unless you're a specific sports-specific endurance person, eating this manner will help you have better gains in the gym, okay, um, in terms of performance. You end up shifting when you eat more of like our ancestors, you end up shifting into ketosis or keto ketogenesis, which is really a fat burning state. So you, your, your cells start to shift over from burning primarily glucose and sugars, which are in breads and pastas and, and chips and all the stuff that we showed on that slide, towards fat. And it's pretty amazing. It takes about 10 days, 10 to 15 days, for your cellular machinery to shift over to fat, uh, ketone bodies. And so during that period of time, if you guys are gonna take this on wholeheartedly, uh, rather than gradually, just expect a, a drop in your energy. You may be a little grumpy, because you're not used to the, the blood sugar. It was funny in that, that story about Macolo, the first week that they shifted him from the fiber bar to the, the plant-based, they got all PO'd. They were like, <laughs> they were upset, they're like, I want my sugar, you know, my fiber bar had all that tasty carbohydrates in it. It said that they got cranky, they didn't know what was going on, and then after another couple of days they were like, oh, I feel better than ever, you know, so it was pretty funny. Um, <clears throat> you'll do that too, by the way, so be prepared. Um, little drop in performance, little drop in energy, but when you're in ketogenesis, ketone bodies actually protect your muscle mass, so if you don't have enough food, you don't just chew up your muscles to make sugar because that's where we are when we're eating carbohydrates on a regular basis, um, and rice and pasta and all that, that we burn sugar all the time and then when we drop that sugar, your body's like, whoa, what's going on, no sugar here. So it starts to burn your muscle and you get weaker immediately. But when you're on this type of uh, a diet style, you protect your muscle and you only, you're only burning fat. If you lose a meal, you keep burning fat because we've got lots of fat. Like we, even like thin people can still burn like a month's worth of food just from their body fat. It's pretty cool and it's also common, it, it, it just kind of ties it in. When you're hunting and gathering, you can't always guarantee your meals. So if you miss a meal and you also all of a sudden start to have to chew up your, your, your muscles, to, that wouldn't work very well because then you'd be tired and you couldn't go chase the thing that you need to go to eat, right? So it's pretty genius. Oh, I should say this. So Mark Sisson has some good recommendations. 50 to 100 carbs a day. So under 100 keeps you in that ketogenic, okay? It varies based on size. Play around with that if you get kind of woozy, you know, bump up the carbohydrates a little bit. Under 150 is definitely uh, a reasonable goal if you want to count. Otherwise, just eat foods from the categories of vegetables, fruits, and meats, and you're pretty much good to get that. Pre and post workout, um, you want to eat fat and protein before, at least an hour or more before. This is going to be person dependent, because I take about two hours to digest my food, so I try to do that two hours before. Carbohydrates will insulin spike you and leave you at a not accessible to your energy as well. And then post-workout, you wanna have carbs and protein directly, immediately, like in the car, ready for you if you could. Under 30 minutes for sure. And that will help you recover faster and be ready for your next workout quicker. And then endurance. So if you are an endurance athlete and you like to do things that are one and a half hours or more. That's not necessarily the healthiest exercise from what the research is pointing to because it does cause some inflammation in our body, but it also means that you're gonna probably have to experiment with this diet because our ancestors, they walked a lot 
and they sprinted and, and tried to hunt stuff, but they didn't do like a lot of like medium intensity heart rate up for a long time. You might have to add some carbohydrates like oatmeal or something like that, just or tubers, lots of potatoes, things like that. Like after a workout, it would be like a sweet potato. It's already been cooked, something like that. That'd be a good one. And maybe a piece of chicken or turkey. Before would be maybe some nuts, you know, some macadamia nuts. If you guys don't eat macadamia nuts, I strongly suggest you eat macadamia nuts. They're delicious. <laughs> oh man, they're like little balls of butter. It's crazy. <laughs> oh yeah, you can eat butter. Lots of butter, go for it. Just try to get grass-fed butter, more fat. Fat, if, when we eat fat, we lose fat. When we eat sugar, carbohydrates, we gain fat. Okay, it's hormonally. So it matters more, you know how we, I to told you that the gorillas ate twice as many calories, but still lost weight? It has to do with hormones. Carbohydrates trigger hormones to tell us to store excess weight. Store, store, store. So 50 grams of, of sugar is different than 50 grams of fat. How it, how it impacts you horm hormonally. All that time I told you when I was trying to get ripped and all that stuff, I was cutting out fat, I was eating, you know, d by the pyramid, I was doing everything perfect, I never saw any abs. Ever. I was like mine and I was like, where are they? You know, and uh, as soon as I made this switch, they started to surface. It was cool. It only took a couple weeks. It was pretty awesome. All right. A couple of uh, supplement discussions. There's only four supplements that I recommend based on the research that I've found that I think that uh, is good, really pertinent. Okay. So I call it a dangerous deficiency omega-3 fatty acids. If you're not supplementing with some sort of healthy fish oil, you're leaving yourself a chance for inflammation. Okay? So inflammation causes chronic disease. So um, this is essentially when you think of protein to your biceps or your muscles, and you think of calcium to your bones, omega-3 fatty acids is to your nervous system, your brain, healthy. It's really a potent thing and it should be, we should take more of it, we should have more of it. Wild game, it's hard to make the balance. Okay? So that's a good question. If you're eating a lot of wild game, wild caught salmon, cold, cold fish, cold water fish, um, What's another one? Sardines. Flax seeds have it, but they don't have the same, they don't have the same uh, type. So there's different types of omega-3s, okay. and the, uh, that's a biochemistry question that we'd have to get into afterwards, because not everybody would care about the answer to that. <laughs> um, but yeah, you, I'm sorry to assume. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so. How about the krill oil? That would probably have the right kind because it's from an animal or a fish or whatever a krill is. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Next would be probiotics. Okay. You can get this from food as well, like kimchi or sauerkraut or water kefir, which we had an awesome demo here this last week. Uh, but probiotics, I like to use the analogy of the Yankees versus the Sox. Okay, Red Sox, Yankees. Let's say, um, let's pretend we're all Sox fans because I came here from Boston. And all of those chairs right there that you guys are sitting in is like spaces on your intestines because your intestines are lined with bacteria. They got all these little chairs for bacteria, which are Sox for the Red Sox fans, okay? Now, if a Red Sox fan, which I'm gonna assume Mercy is, um, is sitting there, a, a Yankee fan who's coming along who's like, I wanna root for the Yankees, well, they can't sit there because Marissa's sitting there. Okay, so we want to make sure that we have lots of good bacteria, otherwise bad bacteria will sit there and they cause all kinds of problems. You guys get that analogy there? Okay, try to make it easy here. All right, um, so you can get that from actually taking like a capsule of probiotic which has the organisms in there, or you can do it through kimchi and sauerkraut, uh, water kefir, kombucha. There we go, that's the one I was looking for. Okay, um, but yeah, it really improves immune system. Uh, big time, your guts are where most of your immune system lies. Um, it outcompetes the bad bacteria, produces important um, vitamins, minerals. Nope, there we go. Just brew it. Uh, dangerous deficiency number three, vitamin D. It's crazy to be talking about this in Southern California, but we are deficient in vitamin D here too because we have constructed these non-paleo-like office buildings with these terrible lights that I'm working on. Um, but we sit, we're inside them most of the day. You know, and so we don't get access to the sun, which is how we can create vitamin D from our skin, which is pretty amazing. But uh, if you look at this uh, stats here that 40% of Americans are deficient in vitamin D. Vitamin D cancers were responsible for half of the cancer deaths in 2007. Oh yeah, so windows or glass, glass and clouds block 
some of what we need there. Um, and sunscreen too. So if you're going to be out on the beach, try to get some sun before you put the sunscreen on. Same for the kids. Get a little bit of sun before you put that on, like 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 minutes, whatever you can tolerate. Best to build up a tan base. Um, don't burn, that's not what we're saying. And also it can cause chronic pain, colds, flus, big time. So this time of year when we have lots of colds and flus going around, making sure that you're out in the sun or you're taking vitamin D on a regular basis. It's about 5,000 IUs for someone 200 pounds, so probably half of that for 100 pounds, something in there. Okay, I've got a handout if you guys want to look at that. Okay, this one I call a deficiency, not a dangerous deficiency. Other people might disagree, but a whole food vitamin. If you're eating really clean and you're doing all you can there, you know, you might, eh, it's up to you. But there are some definite changes in the soil since the last 50 years, how we farm techniques there. We've depleted a lot of them, so there's, it's a way to fill in the gaps there. If you're doing smoothies or juicing, that can cover it too. But make sure you're not taking any synthetic vitamins, okay? Nothing synthetic, man-made, okay? If it's a vitamin, it's got to be whole food based, meaning not that it came from whole foods, but that it's made, <laughs> they have decent stuff too. But um, that it's actually, they take you know, oranges and they, and there you go, you take that. Versus we've you know, created something in this Frankenstein lab and you should take this because it has seven billion, trillion, zillion, of what this little capsule, you're only, oh, your whole food stuff only has a little bit? We have a billion of that. It's like, well, yeah, but it's fake. And they show, sorry, I went on a tangent there, but um, research, they it increased death, cancer, heart disease, birth defects from synthetic vitamins. Yes? So how do you know if it's, like, if I'm looking at a vitamin, if it's whole food, not synthetic? Like, is it because there's chemicals on that? Yeah. You'll just yeah. see the chemicals? Yeah. That's pretty much it. You look at the back and you would understand most of the ingredients, if not all of them. Yeah, yeah. Vitamin K. What about it? Is that important? Yeah. Yeah, they're all important. But if you eat, if you eat like lots of vegetables and seafood and meat, you, you get them all. Yeah, yeah, get them all. So, but yeah, if you're going to take a whole food base, make sure that's from a good source. I have this up here because this is my favorite brand, uh, but this isn't the only brand. Um, at some point, we will sell all of these to make it easier for our clients, but we don't yet. Uh, we do sell the omega-3s, but this is uh, vitamin D, a whole food soup, uh, and then a probiotic. One last idea on eating. Sometimes, this might be crazy, but it is okay to skip it. Okay, so there's a lot of research coming out there about fasting, intermittent periodic fasting, where you miss meals. Okay, in our culture, we don't do that very often. But uh, there's some real benefits to a lot of things in, a, in, in our body when we hit this 15 to 17 hour range without food. Okay, your body goes into this, auto, it's called autophagy, where it, it cells start to get this signal saying, hey, we're, we're on a scarcity. Let's start, instead of growing, instead of producing and making new cells and going through mitosis, let's clean up our own cell right now. Let's debride it. Let's get rid of stuff. Let's eat up this, everything that we can. And so you end up clearing out and cleaning out and you, you end up healthier from missing meals occasionally. So um, <clears throat> on that topic, a lot of people will say, you know, prayer helps with that, probably because it's uncomfortable to not have food. You know, it's, uh, but um, just th practicing that. I do it about twice a month when I'll do that. On a, and, it, and I'm usually pretty hungry. I'll, go, I'll eat dinner, we, then I skip that, and I go until like 1 the next day. So it's about 16, 17 hours. Just something to try out. There's a lot of research on chemotherapy as uh, when people fast during chemotherapy, they don't feel this, the, the negative consequences of that as much. It's because the body slows the reproduction of cells, so it doesn't p cause as much damage to everything. It's pretty, pretty impressive. 8515 rule, so when you're starting this, this journey, there's two, two types of people which is very similar to me and my wife. I'm someone who learns things and then slowly incorporates over time. Like I'll try this out and I'll keep that and then I'll try this out and I'll keep that. So I didn't go from like average American paleo. I didn't do that. Um, I just kind of eased into it over a five to seven year span where each year I was getting healthier and healthier and healthier. My wife was different. She learns stuff and when she learns it, she can't not do it. Yeah. So everybody's different. Um, and she's like, okay, it doesn't mean she's 100% by any means, but she's, 
she's, you know, we try to follow this rule of 85%. Sometimes, if you talk to us, we're closer to 95 or 98, and sometimes we're closer to 80. Depends on the season. Watch out for that Christmas season, that's tough. A lot of holiday parties. So progression, not perfection. You know, even if you eat just more vegetables tomorrow, that's progression. You know, less processed food, that's progression. So all of that stuff adds up over time. Remember where you came from. Celebrate the victories. <clears throat> we have a handout for you, which shows good, better, and best. So this is kind of bringing it all together. Good would be, you know, lots of water, fresh fiber first. That's a fruit or a vegetable. Healthy fats, omega-3s. We're increasing these things, trying to get more of those into our life. And psychologically, behavioral, human beings do better with adding good stuff in versus removing bad stuff. You know, if I say, no more cake ever, <laughs> you're like, I hate you, I'm out of here, right? But, uh, or whatever it is, you know, everybody has their vice. Um, but if I say, more carrots, you're like, I can do that. No problem, I'll eat a few more carrots. You know, it's not a big deal. Um, so, uh, psychologically, if we add more good stuff in, eventually you eat less of the bad stuff. That's a sneaky, sneaky way to trick yourself. Um, so fresh fiber first is awesome if you just try to eat an apple, celery, carrot stick before you eat something else. Omega-3s, get them, take them. Probiotics, ferment something. Vitamin D, sunshine, add smoothies, five ingredients or less. So read the packages. If it is in a package, already it's processed most of the time, unless it's from Trader Joe's and then it's just vegetables. They put them all in packages, I don't know why. Um, <clears throat> but you should, you should. <laughs> You should look at the back, and if it has more than five ingredients and you can't understand them, you know, you know the ones that have like, you guys would probably know what they mean, uh, but they're like this long, and you're like, I don't know how to say that. It's probably not food, okay? <laughs> yeah, it's probably not, probably not food. Um, decreased dairy, green, uh, dairy grains and beans. Beans are very similar. They're the genetic potential for that plant, so they don't want you to eat them either. And decreased processed food. Beans, they have protein in them. So do grains, but they're still, the bean, the bean plant, whatever that is, it doesn't, it doesn't want you to eat its kids. Lentils? Lentils. Lentils are your little children for that lentil plant. Okay? Think about it. You're eating their kids, and they don't like it, so they infuse that with chemical warfare against your guts. Okay? I didn't make the rules. Don't look at me that way. <laughs> That's a good question, huh? So, and that also goes for nuts and seeds, too. That's a good question. So what we find is that when certain plants or animals um, tend to uh, incorporate more of a shell or more of a physical barrier, they have less of a chemical barrier. But if you have autoimmune disorders or if you're already allergies and certain like that, eggs can be a problem. So can nuts, so can seeds, because they are. You know? uh, an animal doesn't pose, most people are not allergic or have any issues eating animals, you know, whether or not philosophically, but um, because they have physical barriers, they run away from you. That's the, they don't have chemical barriers. Okay, good question though. Better, so good, better, best. So we take the good and then we add maybe gluten-free. We switch over to raw dairy, sprouted grains, sprouted beans. So that's if you soak a bean or a grain, it deactivates some of those anti-nutrients because you're tricking that plant or that kid thing. <laughs> you're tricking it into thinking that it's gonna be, it's on the home stretch, now it's gonna be a plant. So it's like, oh, we're getting water, now I'm gonna be a plant, yeah, and then you eat it. <laughs> so, so. <laughs> yeah, so think about, yeah, okay, uh, best, okay, so best, we're shifting from good, better, now we're in the best category, local, sustainable, uh, organic, free range, wild, fruits, veggies, meats, fish, fowl, nuts and seeds, reverse osmosis, water only, omega, probiotic, vitamin D, bone broth, bone broth is good for you. That's all I'm going to say. It's too uh, no grain, no dairy, no beans, no processed foods ever. But again, we're shooting for 85%. That would be awesome. If you ate 85% paleo and 15% not. Chestnut, one of my heroes, also talks about having three vices. You can kind of decide, you know, whatever. I, uh, yeah, I've got a couple vices. I eat dark chocolate. I've shifted towards darker and darker, but I eat that pretty regularly. It's mostly fat, so, you know, that's one of my things. I have beer every now and then. Alcohol, I do like that. Um, those are really my two. Peanut butter, oh, that's right. Because that's technically a, uh, a bean. Okay, really? it is, bean? it is. So, it is, it's a legume. Wow. Um, so, so, yes or 
Yes, yeah, salmon. Like yeah. Almonds. Yeah. Almonds. Yeah, that's a nut. That's you want to eat those in uh, moderation. You know, they shouldn't be the. You shouldn't if you well you know if you go off go to town on some almonds you're going to pay for it if you've ever done that. So. Not it, with the almonds, butter. Same thing. I mean, it's it's part of a healthy lifestyle eating that stuff, but it shouldn't be the bulk. You know, if like if you look at your plate and it's this much is almond butter <laughs> and this much is like vegetables and meat, you're going to have a tummy ache. Okay. And that's because, again, just like that, they do have some anti-nutrients in there. It's just that we process them better because they have the hard shell. They don't have as many. Uh, but some people can't do well. I don't do well with almonds. I don't. I do great with ma macadamia nuts. Have we talked about that? <laughs> uh, they're delicious. They're expensive, but you get what you pay for. I had a question. Yes. How does reverse osmosis water compare to, like, spring water, and why, why is it? Like you're actually at a stream and it's cruising through, Just and you're what they, whatever they call spring water mm. in the store. It's apparently from a, some a spring. spring. Uh, <laughs> I, well, you know, the problem is that we've kind of polluted a lot of stuff, so it's tough to answer that. But and it's also tough to take people on their word a lot of times with what advertising is and what it actually is. Like when someone says grass-fed beef, you got to look to see, well, is it really all the way through or is it not? So. I, it would have to be, you'd have to know what that carrier was and what their policy was. Because I've heard a lot of things and seen that they just fill them up in the, you know, the, the, batter, the bathroom. Stuff. They're just tap, the water, tap water. Uh, in the plastic. Right, plastic yeah. poses some other issues too. We don't want to pollute and they can leach into our water. Um, <clears throat> but we're getting, we're get, those are good questions. But when we, sh we want to make sure that we're shifting on the big you know, 30,000 foot view that we're trying to add better and healthier stuff. And you know, once you master all that, then focusing on more of the more minute details. Okay, I have a couple of handouts, and this is one of them too. Nine steps of progression, kind of in that in that order there. Um, <clears throat> making sure you're drinking only water or kefir or that's what it is, right? water kefir. Um, you know, those types of healthful things, juices, sodas. Don't do it. If you got to do it, do it, and then like kind of add some water to it or something so you can kind of ease your way out of that. Uh, drink a glass of water before you drink a, co a, a Coke or whatever you're going to drink, then you won't drink as much. Okay. Um, <clears throat> great grandma rule, that's the one that if your grandma wouldn't know what the ingredients are, don't eat it. Outside of the ring, so you know, shop around the peripheral. If you ever notice the stuff in the middle is packaged and can store. That's why we call store stores, because you can store food there for long periods of time. If bacteria doesn't want it, you probably shouldn't eat it. Okay? So if it's going to last there for like six years, it's probably not really good food for you. you know, we want to have our food be live and healthy. Eat foods that eats well, add those things, exercise, lower stress, get adjusted, fast occasionally, and experiment. This is my last thing here before we are done. I thought this was awesome. <clears throat> this is the Paleo Manifesto, by the way. Uh, make it meaningful, okay? Even if science eventually answers tough questions like, what is a healthy diet? Why am I so constipated? Are people going to drink their prune juice? Probably not. That's because leading a healthy lifestyle is a two-pronged problem, knowing what's healthy and doing what's healthy. Science is focused on the first, trying to figure out what is healthy while neglecting the second, motiva motivating people to make healthy decisions. The prescriptions of our diet culture based on reductionistic science are just not meaningful to most people. The B vitamins never got anyone out of bed in the morning. There's something else missing from our diets, and it's not a macronutrient or a vitamin. It's something deeper, meaning. Meaning is a secret ingredient that turns a diet into a lifestyle. So find out ways to care about what you eat. Make food part of your identity as an individual. Hunt, gather, grow, or prepare it yourself. Hunt a wild animal, kill it, thank it, gut it, and get your hands bloody. Then share the meat with others. Get your hands dirty, plant a vegetable garden, grow herbs on a windowsill, or gather wild berries, raise some chickens, learn how to butcher them. <laughs> Fish. Okay. Hey, we came from hunter-gatherers, people. <clears throat> Cook food that is distinctive to your line lineage. Learn some family history, dig up your great-grandmother's cookbook, or learn a traditional recipe from your ethnic her heritage. Another good way to create meaning by food is using it to foster personal re relationships. Make chicken broth for someone who is ill. Invite friends over for dinner and cook together. For mothers, having a healthy pregnancy is a good motivation to eat well, as is breastfeeding. Teach children where food comes from. Go meet a farmer or visit a farmer's market. Participate in a pig share, buying an entire pig from a farmer and then splitting it among a group. 
You don't have to butcher that, okay? Um, better yet, organize a pig share. It's also fun just to try new foods. Admire the color of an egg yolk from a pastured chicken. Try grass-fed beef. Buy butter from a grass-fed cow. Take a bite of it on its own without any guilt. Love fat again. Ferment something. Beer, wine, yogurt, sauerkraut, kimchi. Try bone marrow. Try a liver, try liver an insect, or raw milk. Try seaweed. Make your own jerky. Break open a coconut. Whether for identity, family, relationships, or fun, finding a way to make eating meaningful is a time-tested way to make eating healthy. And you might just find that rather than restricting your diet, you broaden it. Thank you for your time, guys. Appreciate it.